Welcome to week five, lecture two. Once again, this is Retail Management, BUS 302. And this week we are talking about retail strategy and technology. And in our first lecture, we just highlighted and really talked about, introduced you to this idea of supply chain and how when we share, use technology to share information with our, uh, with our uh, vendors and, and everything else, you can really improve this supply chain process, uh, reduce your the stock outs, and also reduce the amount of inventory, improve your margins and things, which will lead to a competitive advantage. Now, one of the things that another thing that you could do with your supply chain is, of course, outsource it. Now, outsourcing means that you are no longer in control. You're giving this part of your business to another company. You're allowing another company to manage it. So when we outsource, sometimes we'll use public warehouses or freight forwarders as far as shippers and things. Now, um, Target is there's distribution centers, Target distribution centers around the country as well. Right. But they do use freight forwarders. They actually allow um, use more third parties to do their shipping than instead of having their own um, instead of having their own trucking company and everything else. So, again, Walmart manages everything themselves. They own the trucks. They have the driver, all those kind of things. Right. Um, and as a matter of fact, when I was working for Walmart in Martinsville, Virginia, there was a Canon fa uh, towel factory not too far from our store. And what would happen is um, the Walmart distribution center would send product to my store and we would unload it. So we'd have an empty trailer. And then what the driver would do is they would take that empty trailer over to the Canon factory and put it at the Canon factory and Canon, the, the towel company, they would load up all their product on those trucks uh, the empty trailers, and then the driver would then pick up that uh, trailer now with product from the vendor and drive it back to the to the distribution center where it would be broken up and then sent to, right? So Walmart did everything themselves as much as possible because it controlled costs. This is where we use freight forwarders in public warehouses where we have third parties, so like a J.B. Hunt or an independent truck driver will pick something up at a, um, at a manufacturer and drive it to a Target distribution center, or, at time, or they will pick up a Target uh, trailer and drive it to the Target store, right? So this is where you've got third parties coming in. Now, one of the reasons you do this it does help lower some costs, right? So you can do things as uh, at a lower cost. Another thing is, you know, this is where you got, you don't want to drive an empty uh, 53 foot uh, semi trailer, right? That That's just silly because as you, you know, it, it's, it's harder to control with the wind and everything else. But on top of that, um, it's just kind of a waste of money. So if you can find a way to fill a truck uh, on the back to come back, right, like at the Canon factory, that's going to reduce your cost as well, right? So, and, and the other thing when we start thinking about it, you know, a retailer should be really good at selling product, not doing maybe trucking, right? So depending on um, some of these areas, it, you know, a retailer might not, that might not be their best thing. So they can actually lose their com competitive advantage uh, if they're trying to do it and they're not doing a great job. But if you have a third party doing it, once again, you are out of control. You don't have control of that. So that can also affect your system and everything else. So this is one of those where you have to think both sides and say, is this, how much is this going to help or hurt me? Okay. So again, when we start thinking about designing our supply chain issues, are we going to outsource? And is our supply chain going to be push or pull? Now, when we have a pull supply chain, that means that the store is going to be ordering product and saying, hey, this is what we need. Can you send it to us? This helps reduce overstocks. It also helps reduce out of stocks, helps increase inventory turnover because the um, technology is saying, hey, this is how many you're selling per day. This is how much your store, your shelf can hold. This is when you should order. Right? All these things are done electronically. That's a pull supply chain where it's coming at the store level. A push supply chain is where merchandise is allocated to a store based on forecasted demand. Hey, we think you're going to need this. <laughs> now, 
uh, again, Walmart, you, actually Walmart uses a pull supply chain. Uh, a lot of retailers will use the push supply chain where they'll allocate based on some sort of forecast. That push supply chain can hurt you, uh, especially if you have a if you have a vendor that needs to get merchandise out. They sometimes will fill their supply chain. They'll, they if they overstock on something, they may push out a bunch, um, which could clog your store and give you too much inventory and everything else. Um, and one company that did that was really notorious for doing this. Uh, used to be, well, at least it was, they used to be really bad about doing this, was Revlon, the makeup company. They would send so much makeup because they had so much of it that, that you know, you'd have hundreds of products overstocked and you wouldn't know what to do with it. So that push supply chain can hurt you as well. All right. Now, one of the really cool things, and again, this is a trend right now in, in designing. This is something I think is the really the coolest thing is these things called radio frequency identification tags or RFID. So an RFID tag is just a very simple um, product that can be picked up by a scanner. Now, uh, if you have, if any of you had like an ID badge for where you go to work and you have to scan it, right, over a scanner, that scanner says, oh, this is the frequency, this is the information type, like it's got that UPC tied to it, everything else, but there's actually more information within that, uh, that tag, you, you can do quite a bit with that. And so this is where uh, companies are going. They're now starting to look at how do we use RFID tags on our merchandise? And some of the really cool things that have been done in certain parts of the country Right. So if all the merchandise has an RFID tag and you put it into a shopping cart and that shopping cart has the reader, you're going to have, have a little screen on the shopping cart that says, here's the value of all the merchandise in this cart. Right. And so you have all the value. So you know how much how much you're going to it's going to cost you when you get to the front checkouts. The other thing is when you get to the front checkouts, there's really no need for them to scan anything because it's all calculated in the cart. And so that eliminates, I hate to say eliminates, but it means that we don't need as many cashiers. So again, we can lower costs some of that some way. Now, right now, cost of these tags are, they say it's, a, you know, it is somewhat expensive. They're probably down to about a nickel a car a tag right now. Um, and, but as those costs continue to come down, we'll see more and more of this. You're also being you're also able to do a lot more with some of these things. Um, I remember one retailer, one grocery store retailer uh, adding a temperature thing on their RFID for things like ice cream, because customers sometimes will leave product throughout the store. And so when that ice cream got to a certain uh, certain temperature level, the RFID tag would send out a signal that would be picked up within the store. And it was like, hey, I'm melting. And so then management could go find the melting ice cream. So, I mean, it was it's really cool technology. Uh, again, right now, it's not um, not as prevalent as it, as it could be. Um, but as those costs come down, it will, you'll start seeing more and more of this out there. And I hate to say it in the real world, but in the real world, right now, again, the whole supply chain area should, should focus on fulfilling, you know, focus, be focused on the customer. How do we provide a better customer experience? The one place that this is always true is going to be in catalog and internet orders, right? So with a catalog or internet order, this is completely focused on customer service because that's with catalog and internet orders, you're shipping directly to customers. Now, the key is when you're focused on the customer, you have to design your warehouse a little differently than you would for shipping to stores. Because again, you're shipping ones, you're shipping one product instead of 20 products or 20 cases, right? And so that means that you need to break down your cases into individual products and everything else, right? So um, when you design your warehouse, if you're going to also be using it for catalog and internet orders, you're going to want to have some uh, an area to process things, right? So that is really an important piece. So this is where you won't see distribution centers, you'll see fulfillment centers. Now, one of the big, um, trends, right? Oh, by the way, with these consumer um, 
direct fulfillment, right? Uh, you're seeing robots being used more. Um, this, and, and again, it does reduce your supply chain costs because you're not shipping to store. Uh, it can increase some delivery times to customers. However, as you've seen with Amazon Prime and other things, we are getting that down to basically, actually even with Amazon Prime, if you're in a major, or Amazon, if you're in a major retail area, like you can pick it up on the same day. Uh, if you're in a major city, right, some of that. Um, if you are using a third party, you are going to have problems with delivery. So some of that is there. Now that's the drop shipping. The customer uh, store pickup, this is a, one of those things now where you can order online, pick up your store, right? Um, this has been huge. Now, uh, again, as I mentioned, I worked with Walmart. And so I remember the store that I was at back in the 90s. We were experimenting with um, this idea. It wasn't pickup. We were doing delivery where customers would, uh, this will be funny, they would fax their order to the store and we would have people go through. And back in the 90s, it actually ended up, we decided as a management team, this was just too expensive. It wasn't, you know, it didn't work because we had so few people using it and everything else. Today, though, this has been huge, right? Since the pandemic, where people are constantly now, um, the you know, you use the mobile app. You don't have to fax. You use a mobile app. It goes to the store. The store has people they go through, pick it up. And even Walmart will do delivery in many areas as well, right? So all of these things are huge. Now you have to have the right technology. You have to have um, that perpetual inventory system set up where you have the, you know, the exact on hands of everything. But this is a huge piece. If you can design your systems this way and have this experience that customers really like that for convenience, right? So. All right. Um, now, the last piece that we need to think about with this, with uh, supply chain, is this idea of a reverse supply chain. Whoops. Uh, and the reverse supply chain means, okay, well, people are obviously customers might return products because it's not what they want. It's the right, not the right size, whatever. And so, when we get this return merchandise, what do we do with it? So. If it's open, do we have to return it to a um, distribution center or do we have a return center? Uh, and, and then how do we dispose of it, right? So this is where you have now people talking. Uh, I've seen um, people that will buy Amazon pallets of returns where you don't know what you're going to get. You're just buying this pallet, right? And then all these different things. So how do you manage this reverse supply chain um, and think about the cost and now, what, one of the other trends with some companies is, especially with internet orders, is if a customer says, send, contacts the company and says, hey, this is not what I wanted and everything else, there are times now where the companies are even going, you know what, you can keep the product, we'll just credit you, you know, we'll just give you a refund. Because for them, it costs, it's going to cost them more to get the product back than what the products actually were. So there, that's happening as well. Now, it doesn't happen for every customer because some customers are more apt to return things and everything else. So they're not going to do that for every customer, but maybe for a customer. And this is why you want to know about your customers. If you have a customer who like returns one product every two years, this is a customer might say, Hey, you know what? Keep the product. We're just going to credit, you know, we'll give you a refund because it's going to cost us more to get it back. So this idea now of how do we reverse the supply chain? If a customer wants to get it, this is a huge concern and thing to think about as a manager. Now, as I said, you get these customers that maybe only return things once every few few years or something. How do you track that? Well, you have to have some sort of customer relationship management system, right? So when we talk about customer relationship management, you have to have some sort of strategy or program that will help you build relationships with your customers. That way you get a higher share of their wallet, right? So, and we talk about a share of wallet. So the wallet is how much a customer is going to purchase over the course of the year. You want as much of that wallet as possible. And so that's one of these things. Our customer relationship management system is designed to help you do that. So the goal of the CRM system is to create loyalty. So this is where we have somebody that's committed to us, right? It helps our customers resist going to competitors. It gives us a connection. It gives us an, a, a way to provide service and personal attention. 
all of these things, this is what we want with the customer relationship management program. Now, the process of doing this, right, we need to collect data from our customer so we can learn about our customer. And the thing is, we're collecting this data to learn about the customer. We need to analyze their data that we need to figure out how we can, uh, you know, develop our target markets with their data. And from there, we will develop the program and then we'll implement the program. So this is the CRM process. We have to uh, collect the data, analyze the customer data, and then so on and so forth. All right. So this is that process we're going to go through. Now, we will go to the data warehouse to, to do this. This is where we really start. Remember, we have all this information about what our customers purchased over every shopping trip, right? We All through our uh, purchase system, all through that using UPC codes and everything else, we have all this data, right? And if a customer is using like our credit card system, uh, then we have even more information. We can we have more contact information. Even if we, they don't use our credit card system, anytime somebody pays with a check, it's noted in our system. So we can can, can break that down information, right? We can get uh, customer preferences. We get more descriptive information as all these systems get linked and linked and linked. We can create these huge databases. Now, uh, by the way, just as a side note, uh, you know, we talk about the uh, the NSA from the federal government, the National Security you know, Administration and the CIA, Central Intelligence, all these areas. Right. These organizations have huge databases, huge data warehouses that where they're constantly collecting information. So they, they have the biggest data warehouses in the world. Right. The, and the NSA and the CIA and all that. The largest private database. So if we go away from the government realm, the largest private data warehouse is actually owned, you guessed it, by the world's largest retail company, and that would be Walmart. And so as we go through these whole things, right, um, this whole process of customer relationship management, collecting information where we, we get this information, we have the internet score purchasing, we use RFID chips, loyalty programs, Right. Walmart's been doing this for years. Retailers have been doing this for a very long time. And back early, you know, early in the 80s and 90s, people weren't thinking about privacy so much. And they would give over a lot of personal information, which allowed companies to collect a lot of information. Now, since, <clears throat> since the early 2000s, we have been a little bit more worried about privacy and how to protect, especially since the 2010, where we want to protect our data, right? So now because, and with the internet, you have the cookies, right? Those, that information. So um, the key now is how are you using my data and how do you protect my privacy? So a lot of companies will ask you either to opt in or opt out of their programs, right? So. I generally opt out of a lot of them because I don't want all my information out there, but that's up to every person. So, um, and then this, once we have this relationship, all this data, we are then able to calculate, okay, well, what's the value? What's the lifetime value of this customer, right? In other words, if we go over their sales, right, we can, uh, collect this data, right, and determine how much this customer is going to make us over a lifetime. Now, using sales to identify your best customers, it can be a little bit misleading, but it is something that we want to do. For example, if we have a customer purchasing $400 in December and spending nothing else the rest of the year for a total of $400, or we have customer two who's spending between 10 and 65 each month from December to November for a total of um, uh, $355 per year, right? Which one is going to have the highest value? Is it going to be the one, right? So if we say, oh, this one customer, $400 a year, yeah, but the one customer two is actually, you've got that relationship and they may actually, it, it, you may get them to move it up more because of those constant buying between December uh, from December to November every year. So going to December, January, right? So uh, as you look at that, you don't want to just go with the highest sales number. You want to look at their base, how they, their spending patterns and everything else. Now, again, this is where we get into the idea of retail analytics, where we're using data mining computers to, 
to mine the data, go through and look for everything, right? This will give us um, an ability to analyze what people are, what products people are buying. So if you've ever purchased on something on Amazon, you'll oftentimes get a thing that says, hey, look, you know, other people who bought this, what you're buying, have also bought this, right? So they're able to give you some suggestions, right? So that's one market basket analysis. Netflix does this, right? Hey, you've watched this. You may want to watch this. It also helps us target promotion and plan assortments. Now, as you go through some of the things that we learn when we do market basket analysis might be kind of surprising. Things like the number one product, well, understanding who buys certain products, right? So if we think about diapers, if we know that more men buy diapers than women, which is true, more men buy diapers than women. And if we understand that most diapers are purchased between the hours of 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., that's when most diapers are purchased, right? Then, and we look and we start seeing, okay, we have more men buying diapers between the hours of four, four to seven. That means they're probably on the way home from work, everything else, right? Uh, this now all of a sudden makes sense why the number, to, to see that the number one item purchased with diapers is actually beer, right? Because of the, who's buying it. So it gives us an opportunity to learn certain things about this. So, and this all comes from retail analytics. So again, when we start looking at this, this idea of market backs to get analysis, it helps us understand what people are going to buy. It's used to suggest merchandise, helps us to promote certain items. It's a huge, huge area, right? And so as we analyze this, we're able to then move customers through this, um, what they call the, this pyramid, right? Where we're going through this whole process of moving customers from a lead up to a platinum level. So as we develop this relationship and understand them, we're able to make them more profitable customers. Now, the last thing that I'd like to mention with this uh, idea of analytics, it comes from Target. Uh, Andrew Pohl uh, is a, he's a statistician. He does data mining. He does work for Target. Now this came out a few years ago where Paul realized that um, when people pot, when individuals buy these 25 products together, there's an indication, especially if, if it's a woman, that they're pregnant. Now, the value of understanding this, that these 25 products when purchased together by a woman generally means that they are pregnant, means that Target was able to send out coupons two households targeting these households with items related to a baby, right? Because if you get the target understands, if we get the customer early, the lifetime value is going to be huge. So they target you early. They get you coming in using these coupons, and then you're always going to be a, a target customer. So using this information, um, it was up in the mini at, Minneapolis area, uh, a gentleman walked in, asked the target manager, and he's got all these coupons that were actually sent to his teenage daughter. And the, this man is obviously very angry because his daughter's receiving all this information about, you know, babies and, and everything else. And he's going, you know, she's in high school and why are you sending all these things? You know, what do you, you're, this is crazy. You know, you're, you're encouraging her to get pregnant. And he, the man was really mad and yelling and everything else. And so the manager said, apologized to this gentleman. And after apologizing and saying, you know, he said, I'll, I'll take this information. I'll call the corporate office. We'll get you removed. He goes through all these things. And, and that's where a lot of managers would have stopped. This was a really good target manager because he waited a few days and then called the customer back and said, you know, I just want to apologize again. Uh, I've talked to corporate office and I just, you know, so this manager is really focused on trying to get the customer. And as he's having that conversation with the man the second time, the man said, you know, actually, I owe you an apology because um, after I left the store, I, I've had a conversation with my wife and my, my daughter and I found out a few things and my daughter is actually pregnant. And so all of a sudden, you know, you've got a company that knew that this young teenage girl was pregnant before the parent did. 
that's it's kind of scary in some ways, but that's what retail analytics can do for you, especially when we have customer relate good customer relationship management programs. And so that brings us to the end of the second video for this week, and we will uh, move ahead in our next video.